The Coin Week podcast is brought to you by PCGS, the professional coin grading service. The June Long Beach show is just around the corner, and PCGS wants to invite you to test your grading skills against the professionals. Prizes for the top three finishers, plus a special prize for the first place young numismatists, are being offered. Visit PCGS.com to register, and good luck. This week on the Coin Week podcast, I talked to Harlan Burke about his newly released second edition of 100 Greatest Ancient Coins. What makes an ancient coin one of the greatest, and how difficult was it for Harlan to narrow down 100 coins to fill the book? We answer these questions next on the Coin Week podcast. Hi, Harlan. Thanks for joining me on the Coin Week podcast. Happy to be here. We've had a good time playing with ancient coins the past few weeks at Coin Week. We just unboxed a couple of coins that we bought off of eBay, including a graded Aurelianianus of Probus that was graded by NGC, which we gave away. We just posted a 45-minute long tour of a fantastic ancient coin collection with collector Mike Beal, And we've also received in the mail, compliments of our friends at Whitman, the expanded second edition of your book, 100 Greatest Ancient Coins. This is a follow-up to the first edition, which I believe came out in 2008. I commented in our Coin Week First Read review of your new edition that I like some of the changes that have been made to the format and how Whitman's page layout for these books continues to improve. The coins in the book look gorgeous. And the way you discuss each one of them and the history that surrounds their issue is really fascinating. So I'm glad we've got the chance to talk to you today about it. Sure. What went into your process when you had to narrow down from all of the coins issued in the ancient world, which were the greatest? Well, there's quite a few that could be in the hundred greatest. Uh, And in fact, uh, they've... uh, agreed with me to do another book uh, where we're going to start out my opening part is going to be the the prehistoric cave paintings of France and Spain and around the world just to show that you know where art began and then to show how recent the ancient Greek and Roman people were from us uh, but in this book uh, we picked out what we thought were the most important coins, and also coins that were common, but that people could own. But the reason that they were common is because they dominated uh, money in the period of time when they were minted. So they were very important uh, uh, financially. One of the things I think that is illuminating when you read your book is Not only is the front matter, you know, the informative jumping off point for those curious about what is entailed in collecting ancient coins, but when you get to your coin narratives, the book does not list them in an ascending or descending one to a hundred sort order, but instead it tells the story of these coins in a chronological order based on when they were issued. Can I tell you how that happened? Sure. Uh, what Whitman does, they have people vote. And they asked me to do 125 essays. I said, I'm sorry, I'll do 106. And the ones that weren't voted on were eliminated. So then they wanted to do them according to the way they were voted, with the first coin first, second, second. And I said, no, you really shouldn't do that. And I lost the argument until they called me and asked me a question about Alexander the Great. I said, well, if you read the read the essay on Philip II, you wouldn't ask me that question. And then they said, okay, you're right. We'll do it chronologically. So it was something that I kind of fought for, gave up, and then got got a victory when they had a a, a question. But what it shows is the development and changes in the Western world. And and that's what, you know, makes it 
even more relevant. The other thing is people in my little 56 years as a dealer, people would ask me, you have a, a, a book on all ancient coins? And the answer was no. So this is the first book that covers all ancient coins in one book. Not everything, but, you know, gives you uh, a view of of all the ancient coin of ancient coins, how they were, you know, what they looked like and how they changed according to the changing in times. It's also for many people probably the first structured history lesson into how Western civilization was shaped during this period. What did you find to be the most difficult element of putting together this book? I mean, obviously, one, one doesn't put a book like this together without years of hands-on experience with the subject matter. But when it comes to pinning the narratives themselves and hooking that essential element that truly captures the meaning and import of these pieces, did you find the process to be difficult? I found it easy because it's all that I've done all most of my adult life. And so, you know, it, it wasn't difficult. Although, you know, whenever you're writing something, you realize that, that you're writing it to your most uh, violent critic. So you've got to make sure that anything you write is exactly as good and as accurate as possible. So to me, I, I write so that my, my critics will be satisfied. Which of these coins uh, have the most shocking backstory to people who, you know, may look back and think, oh, history, it's boring? Well, I don't know if anyone would actually think that it's boring. Uh, I think it is interesting to see the coins of Chrysos, which were the first gold and silver coins ever minted. But a change I made in the new volume is when the Constantine XI coins were published by my friend Simon Bendel he made no, no distinction in the issues. And I realized and discussed it with him and published it for the first time, the fact that the coin we put in the first book was a coronation coin. And now the coronation coin is on the side of that page and in the center is the siege coin, which is actually the last coin minted by the Romans. And you can see that the portrait of Christ is pretty decent, but the portrait of Constantine XI is awful because his die cutters left, his cannon maker left, and that's the best that they could do. So to me, that was a very interesting thing to show. I find it interesting looking at these coins, seeing such phenomenal examples professionally photographed. Seeing them this way really engages the reader. L looking through your book reminded me of another fantastic ancient coin book that was recently released. That was uh, Pangarel's Portraits. He's a friend of mine, and uh, I bought a hundred copies of his book, and it sold better than any book I've ever had. And so I've loaned him copies of uh, uh, for his new book on Hellenistic coins. You know, in, Pan, in Pangirl's presentation, you sh he showed how Roman portraits developed year over year, and you see them go from fairly primitive coin designs to sophisticated coin designs to almost developing a style that caricatured the people that was depicted on the coins. Of course, going through your book and following the timeline that you present, you know, the scope of your selections are much more broad. You know, these are coins coming from all over the ancient world. Is there a period in time or, or a place where you'd say this is where the best ancient coins were made? Well, of course, it was in Sicily, Syracuse. That's an easy question. Of course, Syracuse is known for its amazing coin art. Uh, but styles develop, you know, become fashionable and then change. And is there a point in time where you think Syracuse was at its peak? It's when the coins were signed, and and I did take one one item out, and I put in a section on the signed coins of Syracuse, and we list the amount of signed dies and the artists who did them. So it's interesting that you ask that question, because that comes right up to what you were asking about. Those to me are the greatest, most beautiful coins ever minted by man. Although there are wonderful coins throughout. I mean, the Closomani coin that's signed by Theodotus 
is a fantastic coin. There's other coins that were really wonderful, but that particular period is when, to me, the best coins were minted. Did people from the ancient world have the ability to easily identify coins from various periods or locations? Uh, I guess what I'm asking is, how much of coin design crept into the cultural vocabulary of people? And, you know, how long did effigies like those that, you know, you might see from a ruler remain familiar to people after that ruler's time had passed? Well, there's about three answers to that question. The first one is the signed coins by Kimon and Uenitos, the decadrams, were so popular that when they started minting the unsigned ones, people became unhappy, and they took the rusty dies out of storage and restruck the signed coins with rusty dies. So people understood how beautiful the coins were. There were also stories, uh, and I can't remember specifically, where people would mint one single wonderful coin, and it would be to show their ancestors just how important and what heights they had reached at, a, at that point in their history. Uh, also, coins are money, and in many cases, coins uh, were, were considered money if they looked like they, the coins they had like a coin of Athens, or the best story is a coin of, of Rhodes, where there were uh, Rhodian mercenaries fighting for, for one, of the, one of the kings of Macedonia, and the mercenaries wouldn't fight unless they struck coins of Rhodes, so they struck the pseudo-Rhodian drams, so they could pay the uh, Rhodian mercenaries. Also, it's my view, and it's not published, that a lot of the Athenian tetradrams, you know, we we call them four, you know, 440 to 405, but a lot of the really sloppy ones were probably not minted in in uh, in Athens. They were probably minted in Judea and Syria and places there. So if you had silver, you wouldn't send it to Athens to get it minted. So you made what was the type of an Athenian coin, and you minted it yourself for circulation, because that's what a dollar bill looked like. So these designs had far-reaching cultural significance, not only monetary significance, you know, being the, the metal that they were made on. But did people understand, you know, coins from one kingdom or another as money? Again, there's several answers to your question. Uh, a lot of coins would have would have wine on them or grapes or things like that and uh and that was so that people would know what that territory produced after all these years do you do you have a favorite coin well i've done someone asked me about my seventeenth century Dutch and they say, "Which is your favorite?" I said, "You're asking me about my children." I, I've handled, uh, I, I think when I got the first coin of Chrysos that was a trial or pattern coin that was uh, a completely different, uh, a new design, but had the wart on the head of the lion, which was taken from the one-third stator that was issued, issued before that. That was rather exciting. And owning one of the Eidmar coins was very very exciting, and uh, also handling the last coins that the Romans ever issued was quite exciting. Now, also, the coin that I made, the cover coin, the left-facing high-relief portrait of, uh, of Alexander was a very exciting coin to handle and to own. And, and, you know, this was frequently just listed as Hercules, but Hercules was generally a bearded man. But when they found the tomb of of uh, Philip in Verhina, they found small little uh, uh, ivory sculptures of Philip and Alexander. So now we know that Philip was the Zeus on Philip's coins, and Alexander is the Hercules on his coins. 
Obviously, I recommend everybody pick up the book so that you can at least own an image and read a write-up of each of these great coins. Uh, but what would it take for a well-heeled collector to assemble their very own collection of your 100 greatest? No, it's not. Because one of the coins from Etna is unique. But I, I tried to, uh, except for that, I put in coins that I had handled. Means that I didn't have to run around getting permission to publish it. And that it was a coin, if I handled it, it means that people could own it. And so rather than most books which use coins from the British Museum over and over and over again, uh, I took coins that we had handled over the years. So there were definitely coins that were at one point in circulation, in the in business circulation, and that people had a chance to own them. But that one coin is so rare, there's no chance. Oh, and also the Theodotus uh, from uh, Closomene you can't own. There's only three of those. And there are tetradrams of Closomene, generally pretty ugly ones from one hoard. But that that's two coins that you probably will never get. You know, but still 98% of them, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually pretty good. And a lot of them are... Because I put in common coins, and my justification was the fact that they were part of the ancient world's monetary system for sometimes 100, 200, 300 years, uh, makes them some of the greatest, but also makes them available. People can own a coin out of the book for $30, of the type that's in the book for $30. Well, you know, my friend and co-writer Hubert and I spent the better part of two years uh, working on uh, a new installment in the series, 100 Greatest Modern World Coins, uh, which hasn't come out yet, but it's planned to be released uh, later in the year. Uh, and we found it a daunting task uh, to be the first to tell the story of some of these coins and the history around them to American collectors who might not be all that familiar with this uh, this area of the hobby. So I can't imagine what it must have been like to be in your shoes and to tackle this subject. Uh, as you said, it's been a lifetime of experience. So uh, I'd like to congratulate you again. Uh, we are quite impressed with what you did in this book. I think if you're a collector of any type of numismatic object, you'll find this book interesting and well-written, well-researched. Uh, and uh, it, it's certainly worth the, uh, the price of admission. So, Harlan, uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. We wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you like this podcast, please share with your friends. And remember, you can download all 115 episodes of the Coin Week podcast for free from the iTunes Store or stream them online on coinweek.com or on our YouTube channel. For Coin Week, I'm editor Charles Morgan. Until next week, happy collecting.